And correspondingly, when we talk about database languages, boy, do we ever have a lot of choice. One. Well, almost one. And I've kind of done this for dramatic effect because it wouldn't look very good if I put up, well, the four or five database languages that have achieved, well, I wouldn't call them popularity, but that people have actually heard of in the field of relational databases, or even outside of the field of relational databases, in databases in general. When we're talking about corporate databases, or even industrial databases or research databases in pretty much the usual transaction processing arena, that's our law, SQL, that's all we've got. Now there have been a few other things like Quell and, and so on, but they're almost unheard of now. Now, we could argue that that's maybe not a bad thing. Indeed, from a student's point of view who's got to learn programming languages, and has to learn the languages in general that are used in computing, it's probably not a bad thing to have one and only one language for databases. But unfortunately, that one language just isn't that good. Yes, it is only one language to learn, but every single implementation of it is different, slightly and subtly. The implementation that you find on Microsoft SQL Server is a little bit different from the implementation that MySQL uses, which is a little bit different from PostgreSQL, which is a little bit different from DB2, which is a little bit different from Oracle. Every one of these is slightly different. And yet, there's a standard for SQL. In fact, there's been a whole series of published standards for SQL which all of the manufacturers of database management systems ignore religiously. Standards are great. Everyone should have their own. Seems to be the policy of database management system vendors. And we could probably live with those features or problems or whatever you want to call them if SQL were a really great programming language all on its own. But unfortunately, it isn't great. And we can divide the flaws. Now, there are so many flaws, in fact, arguably, that we can actually divide the flaws into categories. And the first category are the conceptual problems. We're not even dealing with implementations or language issues. We're just dealing, first of all, with the overall idea of SQL, its fundamental paradigm is arguably outdated. It isn't really object-oriented. It isn't a functional programming language, so it's probably closer to functional than anything else. It isn't really a logic programming language. And it doesn't support procedural programming in any sort of consistent way. There are implementations of procedural languages that live within the SQL context, like Oracle's PLSQL, but these tend to be really ungainly and awkward. It looks like they've taken the worst of COBOL and re-implemented it inside the database. So we tend to have just, at its conceptual heart, a very poorly designed programming language. We also have some debatable flaws. For example, SQL, or databases in general, if you've used industrial database products, use nulls to indicate an unknown value. Now, some would argue that this is necessary. In the real world, we sometimes have missing data, and we need a way to represent it, which is fine. The only problem is the implementation of null that we find in a vast majority of implementations of SQL has logical inconsistencies. I'm not going to go into any detail about how those inconsistencies work or why they're inconsistent. All you have to do is Google for nulls in SQL and you'll find all sorts of people on forums, on blogs, arguing about 
nulls in SQL, whether they're bad, whether they're good. So at the very best, you can say nulls are a source of contention and a cause of arguments in the database world. We also have other problems. Certain queries can generate duplicate rows accidentally so that you can inadvertently generate incorrect results to queries without even thinking about it. You can generate wrong results. You can wind up generating duplicate column names with certain implementations of SQL. No problem at all if you're looking at a query result on the screen. A terrible problem if you're writing computer software that needs to access those query results. If you have two columns that are both named customer and they're different, which one does the software retrieve? Maybe it throws an exception, or worse, it picks the wrong column and displays the customers from an unintended column. Another conceptual problem. SQL is a set-oriented language. It deals with groups of things at a time. Most programming languages are object-oriented. They're good at dealing with one thing at a time. The two clash. If you've ever written database applications, you wind up writing the same thing over and over and over again. You send a query, you get a result set, and then you have a loop that goes through every single row in the result set and does something with it. And you do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that's how you program database applications. And some have said, that's awkward. We shouldn't have to do that. The problem is, object-oriented program deals with one thing at a time. SQL deals with many. Another problem, trees. SQL doesn't deal with trees very well. If we have hierarchical data, like a bill of materials, or a record of a set of directories or folders on a computer, writing queries that will extract meaningful answers from that data is very difficult and very awkward. We have limited support for constraints, except for foreign key constraints. One of the great powers of having a database management system is that you can put rules in it, you can put constraints in it that say these things must always hold true. Never allow those things to hold true. And if we try to put data in that's wrong, according to those constraints, the database management system will say no, and that's a marvelous idea. But SQL lets us down in expressing that idea. Because outside of check constraints and foreign key constraints and primary key constraints, we don't have much else. For example, we don't have a way of expressing rules governing relationships between values in tables outside of a foreign key constraint in most implementations of SQL. And finally, we have limited support for updatable views. SQL mm -hmm. is practically implementation of literal algebra, right? Uh, you mean, sorry, of the... Of, it's an implementation of relational algebra. SQL is... I mean, it implements the relational algebra paradigm. It implements... relations, tables, etc. It does, so, but yeah. it implements it really badly. That's the problem, is SQL is influenced by the relational algebra. But in a variety of ways, it violates the relational algebra. For example, a relation may never have a duplicated row. SQL allows duplicated rows. It also hides the relational algebra. What it does is it sort of gives you a mix of the relational algebra, a relational calculus, and a set of report generation mechanisms kind of all mixed together in a bag with no clear conceptual basis. So the relational algebra at best can be considered an inspiration for SQL, but arguably SQL isn't really an implementation of it, at least in any sort of accurate or rigorous sense.